I'd like to take a moment now to acknowledge our generous event sponsors. We're happy to recognize tonight at the grit and greatness level Applied Technology Services, B&A, and Minor and Cash. I would like to add that each of these firms are alumni owned. And at the Retriever Believer level, Brian Frazee, class of 2011 and 2012, and Angela Frazee, class of 2011, Ron Lee and Kara Freeman Lee, class of 1991, Jeremy Reed, class of 2008 and 2010, Kevin Yang, class of 2007, and Caitlin Yu, class of 2005, Capital Funding, LLC, and Scalable Technologies. Let's recognize our sponsors at every level for their support of the Alumni Endowed Scholarship. We're also honored this year to welcome our former Alumni Award recipients back to campus to celebrate this event and to join us in recognizing this year's awardees. I'm proud of the respect and goodwill that our alumni show one another. Thank you. Former Alumni Award re recipients, please stand now and allow us to recognize you. In addition to our sponsors, I'd like to thank Eli Eisenberg, class of 1986 and founder of VPC Incorporated, for providing a team to produce a video for tonight's ceremony. The Alumni Association greatly appreciates Eli's support. This year, the UMBC Alumni Association awarded scholarships to nine deserving students. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the awardees who are here tonight. Martin Enzer, Chemical Engineering, Chandra Coy, English, Jennifer Kuhlman, Biological Sciences, Jasmine Kwan, Psychology, Jessica Kwan, Biological Sciences, Ann Seba, Mathematics, Peter Schultz, Biology, Abhidas Suhail, Psychology, Shay Walsh, Biological Sciences. Please stand and allow us to recognize you. You're the reason we're here tonight, and each of you embodies the very grit and greatness that will carry you and UMBC to continued success. We're so proud of you, and I have a feeling that not be but before long, we'll be seeing you on the stage accepting your own alumni awards. Thank you for being here tonight. It's now my pleasure to ask Greg Simmons, Vice President for Institutional Advancement, to offer a welcome on behalf of UMBC. Give John Becker a round of applause for the leadership that he presents. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. We're delighted to see you here. Really one of our most important events of every year. You know, to me, it's so appropriate that we kick off homecoming, uh, you know, almost a week of homecoming celebrations by honoring and recognizing people who really speak to the power of the UMBC experience. And um, it, it wouldn't be possible without the incredible support of the alumni board, uh, the sponsors who make this possible, the venerable Stanielle Odom, the director of alumni engagement, and her team who makes all of this thing come together. So congratulations and, and, and thank you to everybody you know, I was, um, somebody on the stage uh, was in a meeting with us this week, David Hoffman. He's the director of UMBC Center for Democracy and Civic Life. And, and he was talking about the work of the center. And in, in the process of talking about it, he was talking about some of the central tenets of the work that he does. And he, was, he presented them as these civic life maxims. And, and as he was sitting there, I couldn't help think about how two of them connect to tonight. And, you know, the first was, People want to matter and belong. And then the second was stories are everything. You know, to me, this night really celebrates both of those things. You know, David's work is so much about UMBC. And the people who are being honored tonight matter and belong here because they're of this place. They have built extraordinary careers and lives. And wherever they go, they matter there because they're bringing part of the UMBC experience with them. And through their stories, 
We're, help, we're able to help people understand really what an amazing place this is, and we also know that, quite frankly, their stories are representative of the stories of our almost 80,000 alums who are living and working around the world. So I would ask you to sit back, um, enjoy hearing these stories, think about how they connect to your own experience, and remember that you, like they, matter and belong as part of this UMBC community. So enjoy the night, and thank you so much for being here. Please welcome Ms. Vivian Armour, Director of the Alex Brown Center for Entrepreneurship. Ms. Armour will introduce Mr. Paul Mangus as the Outstanding Alumnus of the Year in Engineering and Information Technology. Good evening. Mr. Paul Mangus is an extremely successful and very busy entrepreneur, but every time we ask him to do something, he always says yes. And the advice and guidance he gives to our entrepreneurial students is absolutely invaluable. As the director of the Alex Brown Center for Entrepreneurship, I have personally reached out to, to Paul to have him get involved in our programs. He's been a featured speaker in our speaker series. He's been a judge in our idea competition, and he's been a mentor to one of our teams in our business plan competition. Now, shortly after leaving UMBC, Paul started his own software solutions company, BNA, and they just recently celebrated their 30th anniversary. BNA comes up with security solutions that we're pretty familiar with. Think about like the chips in our passports or facial recognition at airports. And Paul's work truly served as a foundation for many of the Homeland Security border protection systems in place. Paul definitely embodies UMBC's gritness and great grace. And he not only is a wonderful role model to our students as to how to be a successful entrepreneur, more importantly, he's a role model for how to be a successful person. So please join me in recognizing Mr. Paul Mangus as this year's Alumnus of the Year for Engineering and Information Technology. Oh boy, I'm the first one to go. Um, thank you very much, Vivian. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I guess I want to start to talk about my arrival here at UMBC. Uh, my dad dropped me off. I think I had my clothes in a sack. And he says, OK, see you at Christmas. And I was like, well, what about Thanksgiving? He goes, oh, yeah, I'll see you at Thanksgiving. Uh, so that was my drop off. Um, I went to the dorms. and. Uh, I didn't realize this, but until this afternoon, they discovered a photo of me sleeping on the floor in one of the dorms because they didn't have a bed for me. <laughs> then I also discovered that the university didn't have cable. So I was <laughs> like, what am I getting into here? So I, I know, I know uh, dorms are always a challenge, President, for students coming in, but at least I hope they have cable now here. <laughs> um, Academics have not been easy for me. Um, I was diagnosed with dyslexia in the 10th grade. Um, I couldn't even spell all the days of the week in 10th grade. Um, so uh, I knew the answers, but you know, in school, you had to show your work. So the teacher would say, you got the right answer, but I have no idea how you got there. So as a result, I had a lot of C's and D's on my report card. Um, my parents punished me for it. I wasn't allowed to watch TV unless I got all C's or B's, so I didn't watch TV for pretty much all of my academic life in school. <laughs> um, but then when I arrived here at UNBC, um, when they finally gave me a warm, comfy bed to sleep in, um, something happened. It clicked for me. I think it was the environment. It was having the freedom to explore and not being pigeonholed into you have to do this assignment by this time and you only have this amount of time to do it, which is devastating for dyslexic people. And I started to flourish and then I uh, discovered the IT community, which was incredible for me. And then uh, my D's turn into C's and my C's turn into B's. I got a few A's, but thank goodness those nasty D's were, were behind me. Um, my career, I can sum it up into Three, three paths, obviously, as an entrepreneur. Then I went into leadership, and then finally as a mentor. And in entrepreneurship, um, I started my first company, as Vivian stated, when I was 27 with Vince Bartosi. 
and it was just an idea of, of starting a software development firm. So I asked people to come over and look and see what we were doing. We had planted this idea in what we thought was fertile soil, had people come over and look, and they would look at it and go, it just looks like a patch of dirt to me. Good luck with that. Um, so we nurtured it, and eventually it sprouted, and a wonderful thing happened to us as people started noticing what we were doing. And then people wanted to help out. And then that's when I learned my most valuable lesson I carry today, is never take credit for your ideas, and never take credit for other people's efforts. And we stepped back, and it was amazing what happened to our company. It flourished, we started getting new clients, and then I saw myself moving into, forcefully, into a leadership role. Um, and that's when I discovered that I wish I took some psych classes at UNBC because, you know, you can give them an instruction to a computer and it does what you want, but it's not the same way with people. So I had to really learn how to, how to lead people. Um, so I went back and forth between entrepreneurship ideas and leadership roles. A lot of my ideas have failed over, over the course of time and some of my leadership roles I failed in too. Um, but then something amazing happened that I wasn't expecting is I transformed into a mentor role. And then I've mentored uh, my, my replacement at the company. Um, now he's the CEO and president, and he's actually getting an award tonight down in Virginia for the top CEO under 40. Um, so that was a great honor for him. And then it was even a more better honor when uh, Vivia asked me to come and mentor people at UNBC. Um, so I'm very honored for that. Um, but there is one person here that I, I like to uh, um, thank, and that's my beautiful wife, Trish, if you would stand for me so I can embarrass you. She's not going to stand. Um, she always, she always was puzzled because I thought I married a computer and not a doctor because of all my cra crazy work hours. But she was always there um, with a cup of coffee at 2 o'clock in the morning and a hug when I had to go into the data center. Um, so I thank you, my love. I, couldn't, I wouldn't be up here without you. Um, but with that being said, this computer nerd married the captain of the cheerleaders. So <laughs> not too bad for a guy who started out sleeping on the floor on the campus of UMBC. So thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Kimberly Moffat a 2016 Outstanding Faculty Award recipient. Dr. Moffitt will introduce Dr. Lejeune Cornish as this year's Outstanding Alumna in the Humanities. Good evening. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to do introduce the next honoree, Dr. Lejeune Cornish. Dr. Lejeune Cornish represents the best of my program, Language, Literacy, and Culture doctoral program, where she received her degree in 2005 and a program designed to enhance critical thinking skills in areas of culture across disciplinary and methodological boundaries, Dr. Cornish was not only a member of the first cohort of LLC, but she also lent her educational expertise to shape and co-facilitate the curriculum that sat at the core of our program. Prior to her time at UMBC, Lejeune had an extensive and successful professional career as a public school teacher and administrator in Baltimore City Public Schools. She then started teaching in the Department of Education at Goucher College, then transitioned to a departmental administrator before becoming Goucher's Associate Provost for Undergraduate Studies. Dr. Cornish has served as the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Ithaca College since 2018. She plays a significant role in strategic planning and implementation, as well as supporting and advancing the teaching, scholarship, and development of faculty for all matters related to the academic programs and curricula at Ithaca College. Dr. Lejeune Cornish exhibits commitment and determination and exemplifies what an excuse me, outstanding alumna at UMBC looks like. Please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming her to the podium as UMBC's 2019 Outstanding Alumna and Humanities Award recipient.
Good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. With an attitude of immense gratitude, I extend my thanks to the Alumni Association, its board, its president, and the nominating committee members for selecting me as the recipient of the Alumnus of the Year Award in the Humanities. I would like to especially thank Dr. Kimberly Moffitt for nominating me for this award and for her kind introduction. As I reflected on what I would say tonight in acceptance of this award, the command, be the change, kept resounding in my head. What do you mean? What do I mean, you might ask? The command goes back to my years as an undergraduate at Goucher College. The Goucher I attended had no professors or professional staff of color. The only people who looked like me were the people who cooked the food, cleaned the rooms, and cut the grass. I just didn't understand why I didn't see people who looked like me reflected in the classroom or in the professional offices. In those days, members of the graduating class could request an exit interview with the president to discuss their Goucher experience. So two weeks before graduation, I met with President Rhoda Dorsey. I asked her to explain to me why there were no professors of color at Goucher. She said to me, professors of color are hard to find, Lejeune. I asked, where are you looking? <laughs> she said, if it matters that much to you, you should get a PhD. <laughs> Fast forward 15 years. I had just been promoted to assistant principal in the Baltimore City Public Schools. And I, had received a call, and I received a call from Dean Robert Welch. He was the academic dean at Goucher. He said that Goucher was having trouble with diversity. Imagine that. <laughs> and they wanted to know if I was interested in returning to teach. I said, if that is the case, I'm going to need a PhD. He said, yes, you are. And Goucher is willing to pay for it. So I am the first graduate of the Grow Your Own Professor of Color program. <laughs> I needed to think about the offer because you see, my dream was to become the superintendent of the Baltimore City Public Schools. But then I remembered what it was like to spend four years at Goucher without ever seeing someone who looked like me in front of the room. I knew what I had to do. I left the school system in 1998 and became a student in the LLC program so that I could be for others what was not there for me. I have spent the last 21 years of my career in higher education trying to be the change I wanted to see in the classroom, in the department chair's room, in the faculty senate chambers, at the middle management level, and now at the senior leadership level. Not only is it important for people or students who look like me to see me, my president, Dr. Shirley Collado, who is the first Dominican American to be president of a United States College or University, and your president, Dr. Rabowski, in leadership roles, it is also important for those who look nothing like us to see us in leadership roles. And so in closing, I want to say thank you because the LLC program afforded me the opportunity to be the change I sought and the opportunity to inspire others as I have been inspired. Thank you for helping me be the change. Thank you. Please welcome Mr. Keith Harmon, director of UMBC's Meyerhoff Scholars Program. Mr. Harmon will introduce Vice Admiral Jerome Adams as the Outstanding Alumnus of the Year in Natural and Mathematical Sciences. Good evening. 
As a United States Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams is an influential leader in the public health community. One of his nominators, Andy Lentz, a 1983 UMBC graduate who works at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, wanted Dr. Adams to be recognized as a fellow public health advocate. Dr. Adams is committed to strengthening relationships with members of the health community and creating new partnerships across sectors. During his tenure as Surgeon General, Dr. Adams has created several initiatives to tackle our nation's most pressing health issues, including the opioid epidemic, oral health, and the links between community health and both economic prosperity and national security. While maintaining his incredibly full calendar, Dr. Adams continues to promote UMBC and the Meyerhoff Scholars Program, we thank you for that, whenever he can, championing the educational opportunities he received, the program outcomes, and continued success here at UMBC. Please join me in recognizing Dr. Adams as this year's outstanding alumnus in natural and mathematical sciences. Thank you so much. All right, good evening, everyone. Everyone, please stand up for a second. Stand up, shake it out, shake it out. The nation's doctor here, we gotta get that blood flowing, okay. All right, all right, I want you all to pay attention to these wonderful stories up here. Okay, go ahead and uh, grab a seat. You know, people will um, talk about my MD or my MPH or my BA in psychology from UMBC or my BS in biochemistry from UMBC but the three most important letters attached to my name aren't any of those. It's the three most important letters that, uh, behind my name are, are DAD. And uh, I am so proud to be a father of three young children. It's the hardest job in my life, but it's the most meaningful job in my life. And uh, Millie, come on up here. Stand, st come up here with me. Right here. So, Dr. Rabowski, you may not remember this, but um, when I was at UMBC, you took me, along with you, to speak to several thousand black women at the Delta Sorority Convention, and uh, I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified. But it taught me the importance of having self-confidence and knowing how to compose yourself. And so I appreciate the opportunity to bring my daughter up here and to share this special moment with me. Can Daddy get a kiss? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I first stepped on the campus of UMBC for the Meyerhoff Summer Bridge Program in the summer of 1992. I was a uh, lower middle class, some would say poor, kid from Southern Maryland. And when I say Southern, I mean, you go any further and you're in the water. <laughs> we were so rural that my high school was actually nicknamed Cow Pie High. Anyone know what a cow pie is? <laughs> I can't use the other expletive because there are children around, but uh, our school was nicknamed Cow Pie High. And that was because our school would host Cow Pie Bingo fundraisers, where they grid out the field and have the cow walk around and everyone buys a grid, and wherever the cow decides to do its business, that's how you decide who wins. But it was also named Cow Pie High because substantially, substantially more of my classmates went on to become farmers than to go to college and pursue STEM careers. Suffice it to say, being on the outskirts of Big Bad Baltimore, and among people with 4.5 GPA. I didn't even know what the heck a 4.5 GPA was <laughs> when I came to UMBC. I'm looking at my colleagues like, how'd you do that? <laughs> you know, it was all quite new and quite intimidating. But UMBC, the Meyerhoff program, and you, Dr. Rabowski, in particular, you made me feel like family. You really did. And family, they support you when you need it. Family also challenges you, as many of my classmates in the sciences and in math continually pushed me 
to be the best I could be. And family sometimes gives you a kick in the pants when you're slacking. And believe you me, Dr. Rabowski had no problem with that latter part. <laughs> like many of you all in this room, I remember a thinly veiled threat about uh, me walking like a broken winged bird that couldn't fly if I didn't show up to class on time. <laughs> now, folks often want to know what it's like to be a surgeon general. And uh, I'll be very succinct with you. There, there are two things I learned being Surgeon General of the United States. Number one, the most important thing is that people need to know that you care before they care what you know. And uh, we go to college to figure out what we don't know and to try to know more than anyone else. But none of that matters if people don't know that you care. And here at UMBC, through the people I met and the experiences I had, I learned how to show people that I cared, and I found that they paid much more attention to what I knew. Very important, very important. The other thing that I remember from my time at UMBC is that you can't change the game from the sidelines. And I say that just in all honesty, looking around the room, knowing where I am, there's a lot of you all who don't like my boss. We know this to be true. Uh, my job is apolitical, but the reality is, regardless of where you sit, you can't change the game from the sidelines. You gotta be in there, you gotta be willing to pull up your sleeves, you gotta be willing to do the hard work, and that's what I learned here at UMBC. So, I wanna also, as Surgeon General, tell you about this syndrome. It's called imposter syndrome. And uh, I am so humbled to be up here with all of the award winners on this stage. I walk around every day of my life wondering, God, how and why did this happen to me? I look at people like Paul, like Dr. Cornish, like Kim, and like Kimberly. People like uh, Kelsey and Dr. Bickle. And I wonder how I deserve to be up here next to them when I read through their amazing stories. But I tell you, that's what UMBC is all about. It's about family lifting each other up and giving us all the confidence to know that no matter where we come from, whether it's from a place where you're dyslexic and you don't know what's wrong with you, or whether it's from a rural community, or whether it's from a campus where nobody looks like you. You know, I was at Black History Month at the White House and I told folks, when I came to UMBC, I'd never met a black doctor in my life. Didn't even know it was possible. Didn't know that was something that black people could do. But it's important that we're all up here and that you're all here tonight celebrating these successes so that we all know what is possible in our lives. And without going on too long, I'd like to say that UMBC is still family to me and I am so proud to be a retriever. And speaking of retriever pride, a quick story as I close. I've got over a half a million social media follow followers. I'm pushing about a million right now. But my most popular post by a long shot by a long shot, it's not even close, was when I was cheering on the Retrievers during their amazing <laughs> NCAA tournament run last year. So I posted myself wearing a UMBC sweatshirt with the caption, who has two thumbs in an unbusted NCAA bracket? This guy. <laughs> Give a round of applause for that, right? <laughs> And you know, during the game broadcast, people from UMBC were texting me, texting me back and forth. They were like, did you see what happened? I was listed as one of UMBC's notable alumni, just under actress Kathleen Turner. If I had only been the romantic lead in a comedy adventure with Dana DeVito, <laughs> instead of being Surgeon General, you know, I could have been listed higher. I could have been listed higher. But in all seriousness, and in closing, I want you all to know how much this award means to me and how much my UMBC family means to me. I've often said I wouldn't be where I am today as the nation's doctor, and I truly, truly mean that without the knowledge and experiences, the networks and friendships, and the confidence and fortitude I gained from being a retriever. I also wouldn't be here without the support of my lovely wife, Lacey, See, you, see what you started, Paul? <laughs> see what you started? Uh, without my daughter, Millie, without my parents, 
Richard and Adrena, both teachers themselves. My mother couldn't be here tonight, by the way, because she's recovering from a stroke. So get well soon, Mom. And if you all have a copy of this, please send it to me so I can send it to her because she called me last night as I was flying back in from out of the country in tears because she couldn't be here for this special moment for me. Uh, I'm so proud of my friends, Phil and Christian. They're UMBC alumni too. And we still hang, we still hang. But I wanna say, I hope I continue to make all of you proud to call me part of your family. And I thank you again for this great honor. And Dr. Rabowski, I hope this award comes with some Trevor Noah tickets, because I haven't seen him. And uh, someone told me that I might be able to, to get some of those arranged from you. But uh, thank you all for the opportunity. It is the honor of my life to serve as the United States Surgeon General. And uh, it's even more of an honor to be in this role as a retriever. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Andy Miller, a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems, and Dr. Christopher Steele, Vice Provost for the Division of Professional Studies. Dr. Miller will introduce Mr. Kim Shelsby as the Outstanding Alumnus of the Year in the Social Sciences. Good evening. Go over there, so why don't you come over here. I stand here with my colleague, Chris Steele, who's hosted Kim as a guest speaker in the classroom and representing Sandy Parker, who served as a faculty advisor during Kim Shelsby's undergraduate career and has remained in touch with him over the more than 30 years since. Sandy really wanted to be here but was unable to join us today. We've nominated Kim Shelsby because of his history and success in business development. He's put his skills to use in the service of improving global health and fostering economic growth, especially in the developing world. Kim has implemented and managed USAID projects in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and the Caribbean, focusing on water, sanitation services, and public health services around HIV, AIDS, malaria, and public health. His work has also supported the missions of the World Bank, the UN Development Program, and the US Institute of Peace. With experiences across the globe, one that continues to stand out was in 2011 during the Arab Spring Revolution in Egypt. Kim was personally responsible for managing the evacuation of staff and their families, securing their safe transit to Amsterdam. Now Kim is engaged in developing systems to deliver medicines everywhere and anywhere in the world. With all of these responsibilities and, si and experiences, Kim also takes the time to share them, serving as a guest lecturer in classes at UMBC and University of Maryland College Park, at Princeton University, the World Bank, and the US Institute of Peace. Please join us in recognizing the 2019 Outstanding Alumnus in Social Sciences, Mr. Kim Shelsby. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. This must be what it feels like to get an Academy Award. <laughs> so, I'd like to begin by thanking Sandy Parker, Andy Miller, and Chris Steele for nominating me for this award. Um, I truly respect these gentlemen, so to be nominated by them is humbling. This is a really unexpected honor. Um, I'm delighted that my mother, my wife, and my two sons can be here tonight as well. And I want to thank the university for this recognition and the foundation that it provided me almost 35 years ago. I was fascinated from, by geography from the very first class that I took with Sandy Parker. And geography is the lens through which um, I see the world. What I learned there was that in that first class was <coughs> that you can study anything and it's geography, anything from anthropology to zoology, as long as the primary thing that you're looking at is the distribution. Where is it and why is it there? So that's the lens through which I started seeing the world and continue to. The only thing I knew for sure when I was at UMBC was that I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. And I'm delighted and uh, pleased by the career that I've had that I've been in well over 50 countries and I've had some incredible adventures as 
the gentlemen were discussing. Um, and one of the highlights is that um, I spent seven and a half years abroad living in Zambia and Egypt with my family. So it was experience that uh, I could share with them. The work that I do today, delivering medicines to about 60 countries and designing the next generation of systems and processes for making those deliveries faster, better, cheaper, getting it to patients anywhere that in the world that they need it, is rooted in geography. You can't manage distribution systems if you don't know where the patients are and how to get to them. The clinics that we supply are often in very remote locations, and to reach them, my team needs to understand landscapes. They need to understand first the physical geography of the place, of where it is and how to get there, but also the social, economic, political, and cultural landscape. My approach in understanding international landscapes and managing global supply chains is rooted in what I learned in the Department of Geography at UMBC. It's ironic for me to be receiving an award when I feel I owe a debt of gratitude to the department and to the university. In concluding my remarks, I want to say again how pleased and honored I am to be recognized with this alumni award. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Linda Dussman, professor in the Department of Music. Dr. Dussman will introduce Ms. Kimberly Patrick as the Outstanding Alumna of the Year in Visual and Performing Arts. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am so thrilled to introduce this year's Outstanding Alumna in Visual and Performing Arts, Kimberly Patrick. I was honored to serve as department chair during the time that Kim was here at UMBC. Kim grew up in Bowie, Maryland, she was always drawn to the arts, and in particular music and dance, and ultimately found her true voice in sound design for cinema. At UMBC, she was a Linehan Artist Scholar. She worked as concert staff for music department concerts and events, and played trumpet in several UMBC ensembles, including the Down and Dirty Dog Band. So she's a true retriever. Under the tutelage of Professor Alan Wannenberger in UMBC's Music Technology program, Kim became interested in film sound, and she honed her skills in both audio and video technologies here in our program. The University of Southern California, USC, has arguably the most prestigious cinemat cinematic arts graduate film program in the country, and Kim's application was viewed favorably, partly because of her expertise in both video and audio. She received her MFA in film and television production there with an emphasis in sound. After graduation, Kim worked as a freelance sound editor and production sound mixer, mixer in Los Angeles. In December 2012, she was hired as an intern at Skywalker Sound, a division of Lucasfilm Limited. She interned for over a year and then was hired to work in a variety of sound-related roles on film and telev television shows at Skywalker. Skim, Kim was always a terrific collaborator at UMBC, and she took those collaborative skills to work with incredible sound teams for films such as Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Thor, Ragnarok, Captain Marvel, and most recently, Toy Story 4. Just to get a sense of the, the kind of artistry a sound designer must bring to a film production, I'd like to invite you all to go home and turn on Netflix and turn the sound off when you're listening to a movie just for 10 minutes. And you'll realize the kind of artistry that is required for that to, to deepen the experience, the sound of the human voice, the sound of the music, all of the ambient sounds that you hear in the film. Kim spends every day listening, listening, listening with her team to bring that level of artistry that so enriches the uh, cinematic experience for us all. In recognition of her excellence, Kim has won both a Golden Reel from Motion Picture Sound Editors and an Emmy Award, as well as receiving multiple nominations. Kim has created an impressive career in what is still a male-dominated profession, and she works to pay it forward with young film and music students from UMBC. Please join me in welcoming this year's award recipient, Kimberly Patrick.
thank you for that incredible introduction, Dr. Dustman, and thank you to the UMBC Alumni Association. It's a great honor to be here tonight. Nearly 15 years ago, I was sitting in the lobby of the old recital hall here on campus, nervously waiting for my music department audition. I was a senior in high school then, and after a time that felt like an eternity, the door to the hall opened and a professor came out and called Patrick Kim. After no one responded, I raised my hand and I faintly said, I'm Kimberly Patrick. And she she re rechecked the paper and said, uh, okay, this must be you. And as I stood up, she noticed the trumpet in my hand and said, and that's not a viola. So I kind of started my UMBC experience with a bit of an identity crisis. When you think about higher education, it's essentially about figuring out who you are and what you want to do. When I started at UMBC, I had a vague idea about what I wanted to do. I wanted to study music, but because of my severe stage fright, I was interested in a more behind the scenes job. Through the wide variety of classes the music program offers, I was not only able to develop my ear for music, but to start to have an appreciation for all types of sound. It was also here at UMBC that I discovered the world of post-production sound for film. I had become mildly obsessed with the Pixar movie, The Incredibles, and its DVD special features, which highlighted the music scoring session, as well as the sound design process. That's when my ears got turned on to the power of storytelling with sound. In that moment in time, I could have not imagined that one day I would become the intern for the Oscar-winning sound designer of that very movie, <laughs> let alone become a sound editor at Skywalker Sound. <laughs> Reflecting back, I couldn't get to where I am without the help and encouragement I received from UMBC. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to say thank you to those that have had the biggest impact in my life. I want to give a huge thanks to Alan Wannenberger, head of the Music Technology Program. You took me under my wing almost immediately. Sorry, you took me under your wing <laughs> almost immediately. <laughs> and you were always encouraging, despite my insecurities and greenness, to recording and music engineering. Alan, you were always my biggest supporter, cheerleader, and mentor at UMBC. I also want to say thank you to Dr. Rabowski. As an amazing leader, you have cultivated such a welcoming and diverse community of brilliant minds. You have also been a consistent supporter to the arts programs here at UMBC. As a student, your attendance at several concerts for ensembles I was playing in always meant a lot to me and to the other students, so thank you for your support. And it's particularly special for me to be celebrating in this beautiful recital hall named after the Linehans. As Dr. Dustman said, I was a Linehan artist scholar, and the financial su support and the community of fellow artists the, program led me to were imperative to my success at the school and beyond. And last but not least, I have to thank my family, all of whom are here tonight, taking up an entire row. <laughs> you have always been my number one supporters and never questioned my decisions to pursue my passions. In fact, you frequently assisted in my unusual creative endeavors. For a recording project, I can vividly remember my dad punching his favorite leather lounge chair just because I read somewhere it would make a Hollywood-style punch sound. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to take this opportunity to say a few words to any current students in attendance. Cherish your years here and help each other. The friendships you form now could last a lifetime. Keep your minds open, allow yourself to fail, and learn from your failures. And with some hard work and some luck, you may find yourself doing something you love every day. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Laura Hussey, Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Sondheim Public Affairs Scholars Program. Dr. Hussey will introduce Kelsey Crock as the Rising Star Alumna of the Year. Good evening. Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce this year's Rising Star Award recipient, Kelsey Crock. Kelsey is actively engaged in UMBC networks and generously served the UMBC community since her graduation. But over the last two years, she has taken this to a new and exciting level that is very noticeably inspiring the Sondheim scholars that I teach. I initially met Kelsey as a Sondheim Public Affairs scholar 
and taught her in a senior level political science course. Now, Kelsey works in the burgeoning field of human-centered design, a method of designing goods and services that prioritizes the perspectives of the people that use them, harnessing empathy and empirical research. As a volunteer of the last two years, she has guest taught sessions of my freshman Sondheim Scholar Public Affairs Seminar, in which she has introduced the students to human-centered design and its potential for informing public policies and programs. Just five years after graduation, she is doing innovative work with the potential to advance the common good by fighting the tendency to humanize people that we often see in our economy, society, and polity. In her employment, service to UMBC, and connectedness to many communities, Kelsey exemplifies the values of the Sondheim Public Affairs Scholars Program. She's been sharing her contagious enthusiasm for that work in a way that gives back to the Sondheim Scholar community she loves, and has shown entrepreneurship in sharing it with broader audiences. Please join me in recognizing Kelsey Kroc, this year's Rising Star alumna. Thank you, Dr. Hussey, and thank you to my family and friends, <laughs> and to my professors at UMBC and to the Sondheim program. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for all the support that you've given me. In addition to my hard work and discipline and truly just a lot of luck at the end of the day, I'm really lucky to be where I am and very grateful for it. A lot of people ask, how is anthropology related to technology? How did you get into that? And in fact, my parents were like, why are you going to study that? What does that mean? <laughs> and to be fair, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> as a sophomore, when I declared anthropology as my major, all I knew is that I cared that we were critically analyzing social challenges that we all experience um, at an individual and structural level, that we were taking a critical approach to understanding how different cultures interact with each other and um, really taking the time to look outside of ourselves in experiencing those things. And I loved it. It was amazing. And I got to study a vast variety of, <laughs> of um, topics. Anthropology itself is so interdisciplinary. And I think that's why it was so cool at the end of the day. And so as I was graduating, I went on to work in the nonprofit sector. And I knew it really wasn't quite the fit. I studied in Spain for my master's degree. And that's when I really got into technology. And what I realized was we designed the things that we experience you know, very interpersonally with the screens that you uh, look at, your Facebook and Instagram apps, but on a larger level too, policy, and it kind of all fell into place um, in a way that I'd never expected. I really certainly didn't think I was going to be working in this field, but I'm so glad that I am because I have the opportunity to work at the intersection of public health, government, technology, and making sure that we're creating uh, systems, services, and products that people can actually use. As technology takes over more of our lives in the upcoming years, I'm excited to be working at this nexus, um, the ability to think critically about the problems that we face and take us forward to solutions. I'm really an action-oriented person. I uh, have been thinking about the Robert uh, Frost poem that um, kind of the first line talks about um, two paths diverge in a wood. And this past weekend, my dad and I went hiking. And um, while we were hiking, I noticed like there were many paths to get where we were trying to go. And I feel like we often don't think about the fact that there might be one right answer or one wrong answer or more than one way. At the end of the day, so many paths can converge. And I think that's where I'm at right now in my career. And I'm so excited to see where who knows, the million more paths that I get to take. Um, I'm certainly not at the end of my work. I have so many more dreams that I'm looking forward to realizing. Thank you so much. Nice. Please welcome Dr. David Hoffman, UMBC 2013 alumnus, 
and director of the Center for Democracy and Civic Life, who will introduce Dr. Beverly Bickle as this year's Outstanding Faculty Award recipient. Good evening. I nominated Bev along with my colleague, Romy Hubler, who was unable to join us tonight because she's representing UMBC at a meeting in North Carolina. But for both of us, Bev's care and encouragement and her belief that we could meet the highest standards were crucial to our coming to believe in ourselves as scholars. Each of us undertook doctoral research that was unconventional and reflected our deep curiosity and our passions because Bev listened to us nurtured our creativity, and helped us to see what was possible. We've also had the pleasure of working with Bev on initiatives at UMBC that promote social justice and community engagement, including Breaking Ground and Imagining America, a consortium of artists and scholars for which Bev serves as UMBC's liaison. Bev's leadership in these initiatives has always focused on inclusion, making sure every person is valued and can contribute their distinctive stories and insights. Bev is humble and kind. She's been content to contribute behind the scenes to many important UMBC initiatives and to serve in critical interim leadership roles in challenging times. She's served as a mentor to generations of us at UMBC who have sought to infuse our work with her spirit of caring and inclusion including students and colleagues in the Language, Literacy, and Culture program who shared their stories with Romy and me. Bev is also an alumna, earning her master's degree at UMBC in 1994 and her PhD in 2005. She is both a profoundly important contributor to UMBC's culture of inclusive excellence and someone who's grown within that culture for more than 25 years. Her rootedness in place is an antidote to fast-paced, individually focused views of success and embodies an alternative understanding of success demonstrated by belonging, care, and inclusion, which are cornerstones of our UNBC community. It's my absolute pleasure to ask Bev Bickle to join me and be recognized as the Outstanding Faculty Member of the Year. Wow, who were you talking about? <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. David, you are an inspirational educator from whom I have learned so much. My deep gratitude to the Alumni Association, to President Rubowski, to Provost Rouse, and Dean Casper for leading this powerfully engaged learning community that we call UMBC. So now for tonight's lesson, <laughs> don't worry, it will be brief. We begin with bell hooks. The academy is not paradise, but learning is a place where paradise can be created. The classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. I've been privileged to have had such possibilities with students, with mentors, colleagues, and friends, who through their diverse ways of knowing and being have taught me about transgressing the boundaries that Bell Hooks talks about and the open-hearted education that is her goal. So as children, we first learn from playing. We climb trees, we splash in puddles, we look at the pictures in the clouds. We jump ropes and sing on sidewalks, we kick cans in the streets, ride in buses and cars, always observing the humans in conversation. And if we're lucky like I was, we fall asleep each night with the people we most love reading books, the books that fuel our dreams. So thank you, mom and dad. The stories of our ancestors, teachers, and mentors speak to us of values, of wisdom, and the responsibility to grow it and share it. I'm forever grateful to my early teachers, Mr. T, who listened deeply and always wrote back. Miss Murphy, who drew little boats on the tops of our papers, that meant miss the boat. <laughs> but then she always invited a rewrite. <laughs> a profound thank you to my UMBC mentors, Diane Lee, for her expansive listening and attention, to Jody Crandall for her unshakable, exuberant belief in our possibilities and for creating the LLC program 
and for Pat McDermott, who taught me to ask the other a question, to imagine otherwise, and always was patient with me whenever I wobbled or wavered. And deep respect to my colleagues and the affiliated colleagues in LLC, but especially to Dr. Kimberly Moffitt and Dr. Cedric Herring, whose fierce belief in the work that we do to advance equity and justice has inspired me every day. I offer my heart's gratitude to David, LLC cohort number one with Dr. Cornish, my life's partner and fellow teacher learner for our daily soul work early every morning, anchored in the humility of knowing that we do not know. Thank you, Dave and Nora and Aaron, and our recently arrived grandchildren for inviting us into your worlds full of questions and dreams and teaching me over and over and over again to pause and listen. There they are. <laughs> now you have to listen. And finally, to the students and graduates of the LLC program, I have learned more from you than you ever will from me. It's been a privilege to share a classroom with you and to work with you on doctoral projects for a bit of time, sometimes a rather long time, <laughs> but that simply extends the privilege for me. How life-affirming it is to learn about you, about your worlds and dreams, to work with you on your powerful questions, and to think together about our urgent social, cultural, and knowledge challenges. It's always an honor to talk with you about the contributions you want to make in your communities and to think together about how you might do it all. I'm deeply grateful to each of you for inviting me on your inspiring journeys. Thank you. And <laughs> Vice Admiral Adams, if Dr. Herbowski doesn't take care of you for those tickets, I have some. <laughs> And now, UMBC President Freeman Rabowski will offer his final reflections and closing Thank remarks. <laughs> Vice uh, Admiral, I don't even have tickets for that show, but, but Bev seems to have some. That's a good thing. It really is. I want us to stand and give the entire group a standing ovation for tonight. It's been amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. So is every one of you so terribly inspiring if we go with our outstanding faculty member. And I knew Bev would be good, but you were even better than good. You were superb. And the words that she used, a place of possibilities, the notion of transgressing boundaries, of reading books, of fulfilling dreams, of talking about what children do, of creativity, so fabulous, of asking the other questions, the humility of, of knowing that we really have so much to learn of what we don't know. You know, I said to the head of LLC, Language, Literacy, and Culture, I think she paid somebody to have some of the people on the stage tonight who are connected to LLC, some grad students and PhDs. Give LLC a round of applause. They did. I, I just, that's. <laughs> What we heard tonight that was the essence of UMBC was the notion of interdisciplinarity. If you, if you if I listen to, to Kelsey, a Sondheim public affairs scholar who goes, or who's in cultural anthropology and becomes somebody in human-centered design, amazing, it's right? Just so impressive, who says to us as a rising star, I've got all these paths, don't try to push me into one path, that somehow there will be convergence, just give me time. Right, so two studies in Spain. I mean, it's just remarkable, absolutely. And then, as I listened to Kimberly, and I was so pleased to hear her talking about Linehan Audit Scholars. We'll we'll be sending that to the Linehans. They'll both cry when they see it. They really will. But I'm going to go and watch 
um, some of these shows, this Star Wars, Rebels. I am the one who knows the least about American culture somehow when it comes to these things. But I'm going to go and I'm going to think about the sound. And I'm going to do two things, Linda. I'm going to turn it off first, and then I'll turn it on, and I'll say, there's your NBC, right? I'll get that. I'm going to get that. And I'm going to get my friends to do the same thing, all right? And, and then, amazingly, listening to a man who can talk about geography being everywhere. You sounded as passionate about that as I am about mathematics. I said, well, let me listen to her, man. And, and the way you were able to weave that into your work in saving the lives of millions of people and to speak with such humility about managing projects with billions of dollars across 60 countries. It's hard to fathom what that means. And, but as each talked, you saw the interdisciplinarity. You saw throughout all of them the work they're doing to have an impact on so many lives somehow. And then as I listened to that young man from that little country town, I used to say, Mechanicsville, who was so amazingly astute to travel, to study, research, to, to understand intercultural matters as an undergrad doing research out of the country, maybe in Africa and other places, and to use that to help me with NIH and talking about how undergrads do research here. Uh, it, it's always a good thing when the head of NIH wants me to help him host a dinner for the Surgeon General because of this connection to UMBC. I'm delighted to do it because I'm trying to get more money for UMBC. You know that, right? <laughs> you know, I have no shame that way. He knows that somehow. He really does. But, but I want us to think about a young man who can be the doctor for the country who had never seen somebody looking like himself until he came and had some experiences in college. It says something about the possibilities. And then a, a provost, a chief academic officer at a fine college where I had the privilege to give the, the, the speech for installation of the president of the Ithaca College, my, my sister president, Shirley Carriardo. And to hear this woman saying, I never saw a faculty member looking like me. And somebody told me, my dear friend Rhoda Dorsey, telling you to get that PhD, right? Be the change, you are the change, sister. You are the change, sister provost, and I have no doubt you will be a president one day. Give that idea a round of applause, would you? <laughs> and then finally, Paul and I have, a, Paul didn't say it, he has a company with 300 employees. It's amazing. And other, but what you may not, if you've not read it, to hear about somebody who was an IT guy who says comfortably, but I wasn't an A student, but I had learning challenges. It goes to diversity of all types. He is a, but brilliance and dyslexia at how many children are never somehow diagnosed and who are made to feel so ordinary. And, and what we hear from every one of them, and Paul, what I got what, that was so inspiring was that you didn't give up and that somehow, somehow you connected and got excited about the work and all the things you're doing. The next time I go to the airport and I have to do face recognition, I'm gonna tell everybody, one of my graduates helped with this right here, right? <laughs> so every time you all go to the airport, I want you to think about that. But look at what he has done beyond the technology, beyond all of that, the chips and all of that, to, to have a newspaper, the president of a newspaper, to start a hospice house. You know, it, it speaks to, again, the interdisciplinarity across the disciplines, from technology to the social sciences, to the arts, to the humanities. And that is who we are here today. And I just thought it was so cool to hear fellow nerds saying, and he married the head of the cheerleaders. <laughs> to some of you, that doesn't sound like a big deal. That's a big deal. It really is. <laughs> Give him a round of applause for having it right there. And finally, and I didn't say it before because I wanted to look at her in her face because she's doing so well down there when she came up, to have a father understanding the importance of empowering his daughter, to know she can be anybody in the world. Give that concept a round of applause when we empower our children.
And so tonight, we are all inspired by stories, as Greg said. I want to thank John and the alumni. All the alumni board members, please stand. I want all of you to stand. All of the alumni board members, please stand. Give them a round of applause. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. Now I want anybody else who's an alum of UMBC to stand. All the alumni, keep standing if you're an alum, please stand. Let's give all the alumni and the faculty a round of applause. A round of applause, it is amazing. So the message tonight is that we are transforming lives and the lives we're transforming are paying it forward, whether through sound or through medicine, through technology, through programs that change the lives of other people. I want you to stand now, and I'm gonna do a quote with you that I always do with my students. Stand up, everybody. And it's about passion, and it's about what we believe in our values. After this, you should know we were cooking all night. The food is upstairs. I always say that, and it's in the dance cube, and please go up and enjoy it. So repeat after me, we're gonna do it twice, then I'll give you a test and see if you know it, all right? Here we go, repeat after me. Thoughts, Thoughts. Words, words, actions, actions. Habits, habits, character, yeah. destiny. destiny. One more time, thoughts, Thoughts. Words, words, actions, actions. Habits, habits, character, yeah. destiny. Yes. Here's the test, watch your thoughts, they become your? Words. Watch your words, they become your? What your actions, they become your. What your habits, they become your. What your character becomes your. Yes. Round of applause for UMBC and thank you all.